The book opens in a fairly dramatic fashion with a gunman lying in wait on a Scottish hillside. He assessed the conditions yet again. He'd done so several times already, but in his line of business it paid to check and recheck. In spite of the grim enclosing blanket of drizzling cloud above, the visibility to the target area was still good. He retrained the crosshairs of the rifle's sights onto it. That bend in the road, there, about a hundred yards away. That was the direction they'd be coming from. When they came into view around that curve, he'd have perhaps as much as five seconds to select his target and fire. Ample time for someone of his skill. His head turned back to face in its original direction and he stiffened to the alert as his eyes picked out the point in the distance where the road first came into view, about a mile away, winding around the shoulder of one of the several hill slopes between there and his own hidden vantage point. A small moving dot had appeared, featureless at that distance, but as it drew nearer he nodded with satisfaction. An anonymous silver saloon car, two occupants. It was them. When he's done his work, the driver's dead and the car's spectacularly crashed down the slope. What he had not seen before he turned away, could not have seen at the angle of view from where he had been standing looking down at his handiwork, was that the passenger side door had been sprung open by one of the many impacts on its journey down the hill. When the abused vehicle finally came to rest, the man in the passenger seat was nearly insensible. But not quite. Coughing weakly as the acrid smoke was inhaled into his lungs, he fought to open his eyes. Every cell in his body felt raw and bruised, but he tried to force his limbs to move, aware, despite his receding consciousness, that it was imperative that he get out of the car. His head hurt. It must have made contact with something. His left shoulder hurt too. He felt sick and dizzy, but his innate instinct to survive was urgently telling him to move, move, get out grunted with pain as he forced his body to swivel in the seat, weakly reaching for the edge of the door to pull himself out with his failing strength, pushing at the door itself with his foot to force it further open. He managed to make it to a standing position, even managed a few swaying steps away from the burning car, before outraged nature took its course and like a discarded coat he folded to the ground. He lay sprawled on his stomach, motionless under the drizzling sky, as the car went on smoking and flaming only a few feet away. Even when the rain began in earnest, striking the visible side of his face with heavy drops, soaking him as thoroughly as if he'd been submerged in a lake, he never moved. The first I knew about any of this was when I saw the smoke. And that's where Jenny enters the story. Despite the fact that the title character of Peter McLeish is a police officer, I didn't set out to write a traditional crime story and in a way I didn't because the publishers classified it as a thriller which was interesting because while a great deal of crime fiction is written by female authors apparently female authors of thrillers are a much rarer breed. I'm therefore forced to conclude that though Peter is at the centre of events the fact that this thriller is told largely from the viewpoint of the main female character, Jenny, rather than the main male character, Peter, must be even rarer. Essentially, Peter McLeish is about a man who's been placed in an almost intolerable position, and a woman who's been placed in danger by her association with him, and what each of them is driven to do because of it. I find it Something of a sadness that the entertainment industry, by and large, is almost unrelentingly often focused on people who do what they know to be bad or even evil and the reasons that have caused them to behave like that and so end up presenting us with a constant stream of negative role models that almost normalise those kinds of behaviours and attitudes. They seem to want to dismiss people who are doing or trying to do the right thing for the right reasons as not being interesting. Uh, which I profoundly disagree with because in the world we live 
it takes much more strength of character to do what's right than what's wrong. Personally, I subscribe much more to something that Dick Francis had a character in one of his novels say. I've always found goodness more interesting than evil, though I was aware this wasn't the most general view. To my mind, it took more work and more courage to do good, which I find a very interesting view. So that's the approach I've taken. I don't know how other authors go about creating their characters, but I often have to do it by casting actors as them in my mind when I'm writing. Uh, so I can see them almost as if I'm watching a story that's been filmed. The cast of this book includes David Tennant. Uh, if you don't recognise him uh, from the description of Peter, I'm afraid you aren't paying attention. And so I sort of had Georgia Tennant in mind as Jenny. And you might also recognise uh, Nicholas Gleaves, Sean Pertwee, um, Ian Glenn. Um, so that's the way that I had to write and have visualised these people. Not all of them, but somehow the main characters were very often a an actor that I have seen in, on film or television. But one of the most crucial relationships in the book is between Jenny and her father Richard. And for that, for Richard, I always had Anton Lesser in my mind's eye. Always. It's because of their relationship that this is one of my favourite scenes between Jenny and Richard. A blackbird perched on a low bough of one of the flowering cherries, alternately releasing bursts of beautiful song and then relapsing into silence, occasionally meeting my gaze with the impersonal black orb of his eye. I continued to watch him without moving as my father came and joined me on the garden bench. I was at one end, he sat at the other, crossing his legs casually and stretching one arm out along the back of the bench, almost touching me but not quite. We sat without speaking for a couple of minutes before he broke the silence. I find myself in something of a dilemma, he observed with a veneer of clinical detachment. As if we were mid-conversation, as if we'd been saying aloud what we'd been thinking. Intellectually, I know there's nothing more to be done in practical terms than Peter and his colleagues are already doing and that you're a sensible person and I can trust you to behave accordingly and take all the precautions you can. Yet, he paused, then went on in that calm, collected voice that he must have been exerting such self-control to maintain. Emotionally, I find I want to snatch you into my arms the way I did when you were a little girl and hold you very close, protect you, keep you safe from every bad thing in the world. I smiled wryly, still watching the blackbird. You'd have your work cut out, I said. There are rather a lot of bad things in the world these days. I know, he acknowledged heavily. But it doesn't stop me wanting to do it. Oh, Dad, I said sadly, and lifted my right hand back and up to find his where it lay on the back of the bench. His fingers curled around mine and held them hard. I'm sorry, Dad. Hardly your fault, darling. I know, but I'm sorry I can't stop you being distressed by it. I wish it could just be me. After all, I'm the one really involved. Ah, 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 he reproved. No man is an island. Neither you nor Peter. You're our daughter. He's your friend. Therefore, he's our friend. That's the way it works. <sighs> I know, I repeated with a sigh. Just... Take care, Jenny, please. He stared down at his right hand, lying in his lap as if it was something useless to him. Take every possible care. I seem to have pulled off this thriller as told from the woman's standpoint thing because I've had very positive feedback, not just from female, but from male readers as well. One of my earliest positive reviews was the initial assessment from the publishers when they were thinking, you know, shall we take this on? And they said this, 
Peter McLeish is a thriller that delves straight into the action from page one. The overall writing is excellent, with vivid descriptions during action scenes and accessible language throughout which should appeal to a wide readership. Dialogue throughout is realistic and goes hand in hand with the characterisation. Overall, the author has carefully crafted a thriller with realistic, compelling characters and a solid plot. Which was nice of them. And it seems that that word compelling is accurate because I personally know of at least two readers who read the whole book through in a single day, even though it's about 370 pages long, because, and I quote, they couldn't put it down. I'm afraid that while I appear to be a good writer, having chosen the self-publishing print on demand route, I turned out not to be that good a self-publicist although I did do all the things that the publishers advised me to do. But it meant that the book didn't have a very wide readership in the vast scheme of things. Nevertheless, I know that a high proportion of the people who did read it found it very gripping, very compelling and very enjoyable. Therefore, I count it a success. So, since everyone is supposed to have at least one book inside them, I'll never cease to be glad that I managed to produce mine and to entertain other people having done it.